Uh, good evening. I'm going to try that again. <laughs> I know it's January and it's snowing, but good evening. Okay, thank you. Er sunne hein agus <laughs> nikele sin institute kursi sale agus soki ta falcha riv galer beg uktran holskalig kir falcha riv er sunne holskal ak er mehein ta falcha riv galer. You're all very welcome. My name is Pat Dolan. I'm director of the Institute for Life Course and Society, uh, and you're very welcome to our second distinguished biennial lecture. There's a difference between biannual and biennial, which my beloved president, wherever he is, uh, reminded me. One is every six months, one is every two years. So this is biennial. But joking apart, you're very welcome. Uh, and uh, I'm just going to let you know a little bit about the proceedings before I do. Uh, please do turn off your mobile phone or put it onto silent or some distant country if you can. Uh, famously, we had a, uh, I made these comments, as John Cannon will remember, a number of years ago at a conference here where I told people to turn off the mobile phone, and just as I said it, my own rang. So mine is off. Um, so just to let you know the proceedings, the, the, the whole uh, purpose of this event is uh, to, as part of the role of the Institute, is to bring us into the community. It's part of our role to be part of civic society. We do research that we believe makes a difference and that we want to make a difference to civic society. So we're very purposeful in doing this, and that's why we're, we're delighted that the minister is here. I'm going to, uh, Dr. Brown will introduce the minister more formally shortly and, and make some comments to you. But you are all very welcome here. Uh, and the proceedings will be that um, uh, Dr. Brown, our president, will come up shortly and introduce the minister. The minister will give his lecture. When the minister has finished his lecture, uh, my colleague, Dr. Michelle Miller, I will call up to uh, give as respondent, and then we will have some time for question and answers and then refreshments outside to keep us warm. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to uh, call on Uktran Holskul Nagalyeve, Dr. Jim Brown, to address you. Karmaga Pat, Akarja, Ara. Kalaka, Agazina Special, Boyer Medus, Fodge Fe Koroiv Galer Gugino, called Sun Sucho, as Gormagi as a chance of Horton Kupla Fokler Olive, as Tlurta as Tlusa Horton, Egon Okaj Tawthak Agasun Sucho. Distinguished guests, Minister, colleagues, Professor Dolan, who's the head of the Institute, and all the various colleagues who are associated with it. I'm first of all delighted to be here this evening to, to be, say a few words to welcome the Minister to this, our second. Uh, biennial, as Pat has explained in great detail, our second biennial lecture. The first one was held in November 2015, and that was the launch of the Institute and the launch of the building, in fact, indeed, that, 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 that weekend. And it essentially is about trying to give a sense of what's being achieved here, what we're trying to achieve in this Institute, what we're trying to do in terms of research around the whole gamut from, if you like, from childhood through to old age whole life course, as Pat has explained, and the work that's been done here, important work which is oriented towards impact. And it's very important to emphasize that, that the work that goes on in this university in this, in these, in this aspect of social sciences is very much oriented towards impacting on the various groups on whom the research, on, on whose behalf the research is conducted. And in that context, I'm very pleased to see so many people here from the various stakeholders who have a, a role in this institute. I'm pleased to welcome particularly Jackie Horn from COPE. COPE does a tremendous job in Galway in the whole social sphere. I also want to welcome colleagues from Skull, the Skull Enterprises and the St. Columbus Credit Union who set up Skull. We've, we've met their colleagues outside and we've seen the impact of their work on the building directly in terms of the, the Seal Cafe outside. Also our, a great friend of the university, Sean Campbell, who's the CEO of Ferolga, who's been associated with this work for a very long time, has been a great supporter of the university. And in that context, I'm of course delighted that the Minister, Minister Varadkar, who's the Minister for Social Protection, has agreed to give this second ILAS biennial lecture. I can think of no more fitting person to give it. The current portfolio that he holds, that of social protection, is fundamentally of interest to people in this room and the work that they are doing. And indeed, the policy direction of his department hopefully will be influenced by some of the work that's emerging from the research that's done in this, in this facility. It's, a bit, it's clearly a fundamentally important department which touches upon the lives of literally hundreds of thousands of people in our community. And many of these are our most vulnerable citizens and in that context, their lives and their activity and their role in society is a fundamental part of what this university is about in terms of the work conducted in this particular research centre. 
and it is important to realise that, that, that we are focused on having impact, as I said earlier. We're also very strongly engaged in research-led education, as every university must be, and I'm very pleased to, to tell you that, in fact, the, the work that goes on here does influence not just should not influence not just the production of, of papers and publications on, but also drives the content of, it, of courses at undergraduate and postgraduate level, producing people who are in a position to go out there and make an impact through their own, in, their own interaction with society. Just to give you a sense of ILAS and what it's about, the Institute for Life Course and Society, as I said, it was founded in 2015. It, it marked a very important development in the social science in this university. And it's an important development because, as I say, uniquely, we are striving to ensure that we are making an impact and that we apply scholarship to the social sciences to create positive social change. We see this as a flagship facility in that regard, and I'm greatly appreciative of the effort that Pat Dole and his colleagues have taken to provide leadership to the whole range of academics, researchers and students who, who are working here on some of the most pressing social issues of our time. Issues such as ageing populations, youth and family support, disability policy, dementia, autism, health economics, and many other aspects which, which impact on public policy. ILAS involves 150 people between academics, researchers, and postgraduate students. And its mission, as I said, is to create, to create research which provides the evidence base for policy, provides the evidence base for instruments which might impact on the lives of many of the most vulnerable people in our society. The building itself represents a large capital investment of the order of 10 million euros and is here thanks to the tremendous efforts of the University Foundation, Galway University Foundation, who were instrumental in, in, in acquiring that funding from Atlantic Philanthropies to put in place this, this very fine facility. And I want to acknowledge the support of Atlantic Philanthropies and indeed of the, the University Foundation for that tremendous effort. As I said, the effort is around applied social sciences, and that's not new to NUI Galway. That continues the tradition which has been gone here for very many years, going right back to the 1950s, the time Luke Thrall Heron was a member of staff here, and we were that a student here. He and his colleagues were very instrumental in forming the Social Sciences Research Centre, and that, I think, pioneered applied social sciences research in this country. And it, in one of its enabling features, and one of its flagship features, was its emphasis on applied social sciences. The wider university carries on that tradition. Our, our College of Business, Public Policy and Law has a tremendous uh, re re record also in applied research. And indeed, many of the, uh, the work that it, much of the work that his do it, it does through the Whitaker Institute uh, is, is also highly oriented towards application. I also want to draw attention to another initiative which is part of this building, which is, I think, worth signalling out, and that's the Community Knowledge Initiative, the volunteering programme. This university has also tried its best to encourage its students to engage in volunteering, and through that to give something back to society. Our programme, our so-called Alive programme, a learning initiative and volunteering experience, has now been on the go for over 10 years. Typically, over 1,000 students each year get involved in voluntary activity and get rewarded for that in terms of recognition through a live certification programme, which is something that this university is very proud of and which we think is important as part of our commitment to scholarship in the community and engagement with the community. Uh, I think it's something which, we, which I think is a distinctive mark of university education in, in, in Galway, our commitment to civic development, to social development, and our commitment to ensuring that our students engage in that. So let me then finally introduce the Minister and say how, pr how proud I am that he is here to give this second Institute for Life Course and Society Distinguished Lecture. By background, he's a medical doctor, elected to the hall initially in 2007 and re-elected twice since, th twice since. I think many years ago he was asked why he left medicine to get involved in politics. I think he said something to the effect that, a quotation from Robert Kennedy, he said that uh, some see the world as it is and ask why. Others see the world as it might be and ask why not. And I think as, as a politician, he's somebody who's always tried to make a difference. He's always tried to look at the possibilities for change and bring about change. As Minister for Transport, for example, he took some decisions which perhaps might have been avoided for many years, linking the Lewis lines in Dublin, separating Shannon Airport from Dublin Airport, which of course had consequences in this university around the Shannon Hotel, Hotel School, which then came to this university as, as a, an unintended consequence, I get, of that decision. Also very important, introducing uh, public competition on bus routes, which had been, I think, a, 
a hoary old chest for very many years before that decision was made in, in, in his time as minister. In the Department of Tourism, he, had, he led the Gathering Initiative. That was a very important initiative, which I think we in Ireland and in the West of Ireland certainly benefited from in terms of growth of tourism. He led the reduction in VAT and the suspension of the, the old travel tax, which I think had an important impact in terms of growing the number of tourists coming into the country. And as we know, last year was a record year for tourism in Ireland, and no doubt the decision to suspend the VAT, to reduce the VAT on hotels and the suspension of the travel tax had an impact on that. In the sports area, he reinstituted the sports capital grants, resumed those after a long hiatus post the, uh, the crisis of 2008, and he announced that Ireland would, and got, got, was involved in leading out the proposal to Ireland to compete and to, to win the, the Rugby World Cup uh, lo, 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 for location for the future. I know him personally through his involvement in health during, during his period there. At that stage, he brought in a number of important initiatives the free GP care for children under six and for senior citizens was his initiative, as indeed was the, the push forward for the Children's Hospital, which I have a, a personal involvement as, as acting as chairman of the Children's Hospital group. And that project certainly got, a, I would say, a big um, push during his time as Minister for, for Health, and I'm glad to say that it's, as of this week, we have appointed a contractor to take on that, on that job, and that job, I think, will start in the next few months. The price, of course, is another day's work, Minister, but that's, that's for another discussion, right? That will, that will all emerge in due course. But it is, a, it is an important thing to say that, um, we, that the initiative is an important one nationally, and one which the Minister certainly made a big contribution to in his time in health. He also, as it happened, opened one of our medical academies in Sligo, uh, while the Minister has as well. That's a situation where this university has invested, I think uniquely in all the universities, invested in medical academies in Letterkenny, in Sligo, and in Castlebar to promote medical education and also to encourage the, uh, the development of medical education and research in those smaller towns in the west of Ireland. As Minister for Social Protection, he's already made its mark in terms of the introduction of paid paternity leave for the first time in this country. He's also secured uh, new benefits and new social insurance benefits for entrepreneurs and the self-employed and has uh, led the last budget in increasing the weekly payments for carers people with disabilities and other vulnerable groups, first, first increase in fact since the, since the downturn of 2008 and 2009. So we have a minister here who I think has made a difference and is making a difference and I'm very pleased that he's, that he's agreed to come here this evening and I welcome him now and ask him to deliver the second ILAS lecture. Gormina Maggi, thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, uh, President, for the very kind uh, introduction and for um, so kindly omitting all the many mistakes that I've made in the past uh, past six years. Um, Director, um, Deputy Hildegard Nocton, thanks very much for being here this evening. Uh, members of the faculty, academic staff, students, guests and friends. Uh, I'd like to start um, by thanking Professor Dolan for the invitation to be here to speak to you this evening uh, and to give the second biennial lecture at this institute. I did a little bit concerned about the title of the lecture because, of course, it refers to it not only as being biennial, but also as being distinguished. Um, and I never really considered myself to be particularly distinguished, and uh, I'm not sure if being distinguished is always a good thing. Um, and of course, I do have to follow in the footsteps uh, of um, President Higgins, who gave the inaugural lecture, and of course, uh, is a great rhetorician uh, and is much better at doing this type of thing than I am. Uh, so I'm a bit concerned I may disappoint and not be distinguished, uh, but I do hope that I can I give you some sort of insight into uh, the government's current thinking and my department's current thinking uh, in the area of social protection, uh, which of course uh, uh, interests this institute um, uh, in a number of ways. And I do want to say what a pleasure it is to be uh, in this new building. Um, I haven't been to this part of the campus before, uh, and there really are some fabulous new buildings. And I think it helps to demonstrate the enormous difference that capital investment and capital development can work um, can make in in reforming existing institutions and also improving them considerably and the children's hospital is exactly one of those projects um, the fact that there will be a new hospital a, a new building uh, means you can do things from scratch that you could never do in old buildings on old sites uh, will for example be born digital or at least when I left, it was going to be born digital, and uh, and you know won't have paper files and all those things, and it just will allow for a different standard of care and the things you can do with new buildings and new infrastructure. 
uh, is, is so valuable. And I regret as a country that um, we had to cut back capital spending by so much. Uh, and the current timeline has us only getting back to about six billion a year um, by 2021, which really is too slow. Um, particularly when you consider that we are, we'll be selling off certain assets and things along the way. Uh, perhaps there's scope to do uh, a little bit more at uh, speed up the, um, the pace of capital development. Uh, in preparing for this evening, uh, I read a little bit about the Institute, and I have to say I was struck by your director's statement that the Institute wants to advance people's lives in Ireland and internationally who face issues with older life, living with a disability, and also children, youth and parents who are vulnerable in social and other contexts. So I think it probably uh, is appropriate that you ask me in my capacity as Minister for Social Protection to speak to you, because in many ways my department and your institute uh, share a very similar mission. Uh, ours is to ensure that there's a minimum standard of living below which nobody falls, and that people have the opportunity to better themselves through work, education, enterprise and care. 2017 actually marks the 70th anniversary of the uh, establishment of the Department of Social Welfare. Actually, the 22nd of, of uh, January is going to be uh, our birthday, uh, and the department was founded uh, 70 years ago. It has had a, num a number of names, Department of Social Welfare, Department of, uh, Community, uh, Part Part of Social Community and Family Affairs, and Department of Social and Family Affairs, um, but the original centre of it, the Department of Social Welfare, was established uh, 70 years ago and its uh, remit has always been to administer social welfare schemes uh, and to bring about greater social inclusion. It's taken on a lot of different functions over the years and is now the biggest uh, of all government departments in terms of civil service staff and in terms of our budget. And I, when I was reading back over the history of the department, I was curious to see that uh, the department's budget in 1947, the annual budget was £750,000. Uh, for the entire department. The, the budget is now just about touching 20,000 million, uh, and that'll be the budget uh, for, for, for last year and this year. So I think anyone who doubts the growth in social spending uh, or the advances made in social progress in Ireland over the past 70 years only needs to look uh, through the history books uh, or the accounts of my department uh, to get a sense of that. Um, but one thing I do think about the money that we spend and the 20 billion that we spend, um, I think we always need to remember, of course, that this is um, taxpayers' money, uh, money that we raise um, from people and from businesses under threat of imprisonment if they don't pay it. Uh, and I do think that when we have uh, a debate about uh, these things in Ireland, too often we talk about public money uh, or government money. Of course, the only money the government has is the money it takes off other people uh, under threat of legal enforcement. And I prefer the terms that they use in other jurisdictions when they talk about tax euros or tax dollars. Uh, because we need to bear in mind uh, that when we do expend the people's money, it's not just about how best it should be spent. We also need to consider the fact that we need the consent of the people whose money it is to spend it in the way that it should be, uh, and their money should be spent in a way uh, that they find uh, that they find uh, agreeable um, and that they find acceptable. And I think that's part of the debate that I think too often is is missing in Ireland. Um, how does the taxpayer want their money to be spent? Uh, and that's a key thing, I think, that, that requires more attention. Um, looking back again over, over history, um, I'm, I think, only the second. In fact, I know I'm only the second uh, member of my party, uh, Fine Gael, to serve as Minister uh, for Social Protection, uh, the previous one being Gemma Hussey, who held office for uh, eight or nine months back in 1983. So it's remarkable that in 70 years, uh, the largest party in the state, and what was traditionally the second largest party in the state, has only held this office uh, on two occasions. So I do think it does bring about an opportunity to bring new thinking and new prior prioritisation to social protection uh, in the coming years. And I hope that doesn't scare too many people uh, too much. Um, the first of the significant periods of reform uh, in social welfare actually kicked off under the inter-party government in 1948, when a white paper was drafted on social security proposing that social insurance should cover all employees. And although that government fell before it was introduced, uh, some of its measures became law four years later, when the social insurance system was substantially overhauled. That very same year, the maternity allowance was introduced for the first time. And in 1954, a means-tested allowance for disabled people uh, was introduced for the first time. The Contributory Old Age Pension came into effect in 1961, payable uh, at the age of 70. Is that, can you guys hear that buzzing as well? <laughs> yeah, should, should, I, should I turn it off for a second and turn it on again? What's the best thing to do? <laughs> I, 
I know it's usually um, they usually tell me to stand, not stand too close to it. Does that work? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I keep going. Um, uh, I think I mentioned that the the contributory old age pension uh, came into effect for the first time uh, back in 1961. And interestingly, at that stage, uh, the retirement age was 70, and the retirement age was reduced uh, from 70 to 66. Uh, during a period of high unemployment in the 70s when it was felt that it was a good idea to retire people off early uh, so the younger people uh, have jobs, would have jobs. Um, but of course in the 1970s, uh, average life expectancy for a man was 68 and for a woman was 70. Uh, so it was the norm in the 70s, the decade in which I was born, uh, for people to work 30, 40, 50 years and maybe be retired for two or three or not at all. Uh, so the fact that we're now in a very different uh, position um, where people are retired for a very long period of time um, really is at the core of the challenge that we face into the future uh, of sustaining pensions and sustaining retirement incomes at anything close to the level uh, or value that they have now. Um, and that's uh, something I'll, I'll touch on a little bit later. Uh, the PRSI system came in in 1979, uh, which was the year in which I was born, uh, to replace the old stamp system. But as everyone will know in this room, people still talk about stamps all the time. And it's remarkable that that, that, that concept remains uh, 38 uh, years later. Um, and maternity leave followed in 1981, um, which again is extraordinary to think that there was no legal right uh, for maternity leave uh, up until uh, the 1980s. And PRSI and social protections for the self-employed only came into effect uh, in 1988. So I think that just gives you a flavour in many ways uh, of the kind of progress that has been made um, over the decades. Uh, and the newest benefit, of course, being paternity benefit. Uh, one of the last countries in Europe to do it, but we have done it now, um, brought in paternity benefit uh, from September uh, last year. And I think in many ways that reflects the change in society and the changing role uh, of men in parenting and the changing role uh, of families in particular. And even though the department is about 70 years old, uh, I think to a lot of people uh, it's still a little bit of a mystery. Indeed, seven months or eight months now into the job, I'm still amazed at the amount of people who still think I'm the Minister for Health. Uh, if, you, if you put my name into Twitter now, I can absolutely guarantee that about half the tweets for some reason will relate to um, the health service in, in, in some way. And I think it's a pity that the department is a mystery to so many people uh, because it is actually so important. Um, if you just think about, for example, uh, the payments that we make, there's a perception that the, the majority or the vast majority of our payments are made uh, to job seekers or people who are unemployed. Actually, 57% of our budget goes on pensions and payments to children, uh, child benefit and other payments uh, in respect of children to low-income families. And then aside from that, an additional 800,000 people uh, receive income support, including people with disabilities, carers, uh, one-parent families and job seekers. Uh, we also operate the social insurance system uh, into which employers PRSI and employees PRSI goes, and that in turn funds um, maternity benefits, paternity benefits, sick pay, illness benefits, contributory state pensions and treatment benefits as well. Uh, that fund is now in surplus. Uh, we're going to, we, ex we haven't reported the figures yet, but we expect to re report a surplus in the social insurance fund of over 400 million uh, for 2016. And that's the first time that the social insurance fund has been in surplus for a very long time. Uh, in fact, since um, uh, eight years ago was the last time uh, that the social insurance fund was, was in surplus. Uh, and that is important in two ways. One, it's a, it does give us some more scope to expand social insurance and provide better and new benefits uh, through the social insurance fund. Uh, but also, we need to be very careful and cautious about that uh, surplus as well, um, because we need to protect it. Uh, because sooner or later, there will be another economic downturn. There always is. I don't know when it's going to happen, but anyone who's been around here long enough knows that recessions happen. Uh, and we need to make sure that we have uh, headroom there to deal with rising unemployment, which will inevitably follow uh, from uh, an economic downturn when it occurs. And we also need to um, build up some headroom to prepare for ageing as the population gets older, uh, to have money in the fund uh, to pay for pensions. And that's, of course, uh, a really important uh, challenge. And we will do an actuarial review of the fund this year uh, to get some actuarial projections. Uh, on, on how we, what we need to do with the fund um, in, in the coming years. Uh, we also have overall responsibility for the employment activation service, getting people from welfare into work, uh, and also overall responsibility uh, for pension policy. And as I always like to say, particularly when I meet um, chambers of commerce and business people, uh, absolutely everyone in this room will receive hundreds of payments from my department at some stage during their lives. And 
probably everyone in this room knows this, but um, I get terrible gaffes of surprise when I say this uh, at meetings with uh, business people and chambers of commerce in particular. And of course, I say to them, if you think about it, uh, it starts with child benefit. Uh, when you're a child, it finishes with the state contributory pension or, or the state uh, non contributory pension when you retire, and in between every other contingency you can possibly imagine, uh, from uh, maternity to paternity to illness uh, to redundancy to unemployment. So it really is a department uh, that impacts on households uh, and on the life course in perhaps a way that none other does. As you know, throughout the recession, uh, social transfers performed very strongly in reducing the at-risk of poverty rate. Transfers reduced the at-risk of poverty rate between 50% and 60%. And in 2014, the latest year for which we've got full statistics, social transfers excluding pensions reduced the at-risk of poverty rate from 37.4% to 16.3%, a poverty reduction effect of 56.4%. So I suppose, to cut a long story short, if it wasn't for social transfers, um, over 40% of the population uh, would be in poverty or at risk of poverty. And if you study other jurisdictions, the Irish poverty reduction impact of social transfers uh, is the highest in the European Union. And I've no doubt that this is one of the reasons why Ireland, uh, during the worst of the financial crisis, avoided the level of social division, unrest and upheaval uh, that occurred in other countries um, that experienced bailouts. The fact that we had a strong safety net uh, did provide uh, for greater social cohesion uh, than occurred in other places. And combined with a very progressive income tax system, social transfers ensured that Ireland is above average in terms of income equality in the OECD and ahead of almost all other English-speaking countries, including the, the UK, the United States, Canada, Australia and New Zealand as something not often recognised in, in public commentary. The progressive impact which social protection can deliver was also demonstrated in the social impact assessment of the recent budget. Uh, the assessment based on the ERSRI switch model, uh, which takes tax and welfare micro -simula simulation, uh, showed that the budget confirmed uh, and succeeded in its goal of ensuring that everyone would benefit in some way from the budget, with the greatest benefits going to the 20% to the least well off very modest benefits, admittedly, uh, but the greater benefits going to the least well-off um, is significant and is a change from previous budgets. The analysis shows that the main tax and social welfare changes will increase average household incomes by about €9.20 Euros and 20 cents per week and finds that this is principally as a result of measures brought, for, brought forward by the Department uh, to increase working age payments in particular, uh, with a very strong progressive pattern and bigger gains from those, for those on lowest incomes. But social protection is, of course, not just about the provision of financial assistance. It's also about helping people to get further qualifications or training, uh, to better themselves and to avail of the opportunities that are available. Training and securing additional qualifications needs to say increases individuals' chances of getting a job, which of course is the most effective way to help lift people and families out of poverty. Welfare should be a safety net and a second chance, not a way of life except perhaps where profound disability or caring roles necessitate it. A few months ago, I set up my priorities for my tenure as Minister, and I want to focus on a few of these, particularly in the context of the vulnerable groups identified by the Institute. The most important priority is going to be continuing to reduce unemployment and the poverty and social exclusion that's connected to it. That's done in partnership with uh, government departments and other agencies and, of course, employers in the private sector. Unemployment has already fallen by more than half since the peak back in 2012. Uh, at that point, it stood at 15%. It's now around 7.2%, uh, with long-term unemployment down to about 4%. Uh, we ex exceeded our target this year, or rather last year, to move 20,000 people from long-term unemployment uh, into work. We don't have the exact figures yet, yet but it's closer to 27,000, 28,000 in terms of the number of people who were long-term unemployed last year uh, that moved into work. Uh, and we've set a target uh, over the next couple of years, over the next five years really, to move 100,000 people uh, from welfare into work, to reduce unemployment to between 5 and 6%, and to bring long-term unemployment down below 2.5%, uh, which is effectively, effectively full, un uh, full employment. It's going to involve a lot more one-to-one -one engagement with job seekers through our intro service, um, through job paths, through local employment services, it's also going to involve a redesigning, a recalibration of employment schemes uh, like community employment 
particularly reflecting the changes of the economy and the changes in the labour market, placing a much greater emphasis on social inclusion and those who find it hardest to secure and hold down a job. Uh, also, what we have to do, and it's, it may be a statement of the obvious, but it's important to say it, is to make sure that we make more attractive, uh, that we make work more attractive uh, through sustainable and affordable increases in the minimum wage and in pay in general, and helping to reduce the cost of going to work uh, through subsidised childcare, healthcare, and more educational opportunities. It will involve a greater engagement with business and employers, and I think one of the best things that any employer can do uh, for their city or community, uh, for the economy and for society in general, is to offer somebody who is long-term unemployed or a young person who's unemployed the chance and opportunity of a job. And for, that's a particular reason why uh, my department uh, subsidises the wages uh, of people who are taken off the live register, who have been on the live register long-term, uh, or young people who are on the live register. Uh, and that's um, a programme that is under of by employers, uh, unfortunately, and something we need to promote a little bit more. I'm also very conscious of the particular issues faced by families uh, who are on low incomes. We're currently preparing plans to develop a new working family payment with the twin aims of reducing child poverty and also ensuring that no family is better off on welfare than in work. I intend to have the proposals ready for inclusion in the budget for 2018 and essentially we're looking at three options. Uh, the first option is a new payment uh, that would replace the family income supplement and top-ups for dependent children. Uh, the second option is a new payment that would be in addition to those existing payments and the third, which is the simplest but the most expensive, is a general uh, top-up, a second tier, if you like, of child benefit uh, for low-income families in general. And we're working on those proposals now and hope to have them in the mix for the budget negotiations uh, in June and onwards. As unemployment continues to decline, we also have the opportunity to reduce the number of jobless households. We're currently developing an action plan for jobless households, which, building on the supports already in place, will seek to assist further those families back into employment and out of poverty. It's a specific commitment in the programme for government, and it's also one of our country-specific rec recommendations um, that we have to report to the European Union about. But the key focus there really is going to be on, on inter intergenerational unemployment, uh, those families in which nobody uh, has worked uh, for a number uh, of generations. Um, and it's going to be quite an interesting plan, I think, uh, once we're ready to agree it and publish it. Uh, we've also, we're also developing a number of direct supports, uh, particularly uh, the expansion of the free school breakfast scheme. As you know, children who've had a good breakfast are more likely to attend school, more likely to concentrate, uh, and, more like, and less likely to have discipline, discipline problems. So we've agreed already to extend um, the programme to all DESH schools that don't already have it, any new DESH schools, DESH being disadvantaged schools, uh, but also, for, also an expansion to about 35,000 children uh, who are not in DESH schools, uh, because as we know, most disadvantaged children don't actually attend uh, disadvantaged schools. Uh, it's important that we start to recognise that a bit better uh, and provide um, uh, supports to schools um, uh, who have children with disadvantage that may not have a geographical designation themselves, and we're very much aligning with the Department of Education uh, in doing exactly that. Uh, as, um, as, uh, as the President mentioned earlier, um, I'm a big supporter of self-employment, and the government is committed to encouraging entrepreneurship. My father and grandfather were self-employed, self and I've been self-employed for a period of time myself. I know the benefits and the potential opportunities of being your own boss, uh, but also the enormous risks that come with being self-employed. For example, the difficulties in doing things that employees find very normal. Uh, taking annual leave, somebody to cover for you when you do, getting sick, getting time off to attend a funeral or a communion, wondering what will happen to the family if you can't work anymore. While many don't see the self-employed as vulnerable, because many of them, by no means all of them, are well off, in reality they are, uh, and if anything goes wrong, they can find themselves in a very difficult position. So the government is already in the process of equalising the tax credits paid to the self-employed, and from this year, self-employed people who pay PRSI at Class S will gain new benefits, including access to treatment benefits for the first time, that's the uh, dental and optical benefits. They'll also be able to apply for the invalidity pension for the first time, in, uh, in the first time from December this year. So if a self-employed person can no longer work uh, 
due to a serious injury or due to long-term illness, they'll be able to fall back on the support of the state without being means tested against the value of their assets, business savings or their partner's income. That's something I was determined to, to change if I ever got the opportunity to do it, because particularly uh, during the recession period and even this election knocking on doors or the last election knocking on doors, I just met so many people who particularly had been involved in construction, uh, from the construction worker to the architect um, who lost their job and received no social protection, um, either because they had some savings uh, or because their partner um, was working. And often that income was the second income in the house, but because somebody in the house had a second income, uh, they were going to get nothing as a result. And I felt that was very unfair and something that I was determined to change uh, and that will change uh, this year. And that leaves really only one substantial benefit job seekers benefits um, and when we started to work on how we might do that it's a really tricky piece of work uh, because when, when an employee becomes unemployed it's very obvious that they should get something set aside uh, but when a self-employed person becomes unemployed it's not so obvious and that takes away jobs uh, so I think something we seem to have figured out uh, and we're determined to figure it out too and bring put that into place in our final piece uh, certainly during the uh, duration of uh, this building so notwithstanding very genuine concerns about of the workforce who are self-employed have been stable for decades. And I'd like to see it increase, but I believe extending social protections to the self-employed is one of the best ways of doing that. As all of you will know, pensions and planning for the future sustainable pensions is an enormous issue and an enormous challenge uh, for our society. There are, of course, many different types of pensions, two types of state pensions, public sector pensions, uh, private defined challenges and the issues relating to each of these are very different, and different solutions and reforms are required in each case to ensure long-term sustainability. Now, many of you know that pensioner poverty in Ireland stands at around 2%, uh, against 8% uh, for the general population, and relative to other countries, pensioner poverty in Ireland is very low, and it's very important that we keep it that way, but we won't be able to do that. that we don't just protect people from poverty and old age, but I want people to have enough money saved uh, to enjoy a good quality of life uh, in, in their later years. So what I intend to do is to develop, publish, and commence the implementation of an action plan for a reform of pensions. It will include a roadmap for the reform of the state pensions, rationalisation of existing defined benefit and defined contribution pensions, the transposition of the new European IOP directive, Reduction of an auto enrollment defined contribution pension for all working people, or similar to that that exists in New Zealand or Britain or Australia, and also greater flexibility around retirement age, uh, allowing people more choice about when they retire and how they retire. I also know that the area of disability is of huge interest to this institute, and my department is a very important function in this area, not least by providing in inter support, uh, such as the disability allowance, illness benefits allowance. My department also supports people with disabilities and their employers to facilitate their return to work. But the employment rate among people with disabilities in Ireland is still very low, and among some groups, such as people who are blind and have a, a sight loss, uh, is extremely low, uh, even compared to the United Kingdom. I'm very fortunate to have a very committed and very able and passionate Minister of State uh, working with me on a cross-government basis uh, on this issue in the form of Damien McGrath. OECD has pointed out that too many workers leave the labour market permanently due to health problems or disability, and too few people build a huge work capacity to manage to remain in employment. That's true in Ireland and also true internationally, but it shouldn't have to be the case, and that's why the department is increasingly focusing on the capacity of an individual rather than their incapacity. The future will be about the work that you can do. Provided we keep the economy on track, and provided the macroeconomic climate remains favourable, I think we can do a lot of good in the next couple of years. We can improve living standards for all of our people. We can assist many more people to move from welfare to work. We can support self-employment and self-reliance. We can develop a much stronger social insurance system based on the contributing principle. We can enable more people to make adequate provisions. 
fishing for old age. And we can reduce poverty rates to what they were before the financial crisis and then lower again. And while we may differ uh, on how we get there, I think these are objectives that we all share. And I certainly invite the Institute to help us in that work in terms of production of research and analysis that's evidence based and peer reviewed. And I really invite you to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, I'm delighted now to call on my esteemed colleague, Dr. Michelle Miller, who's a senior lecturer at the School of Political Science and Sociology and senior research fellow here, fellow here at the Institute at the UNESCO Child and Family Research Centre to uh, give a brief response. Minister, Professor Dolan, President Brown, invited guests and colleagues. A more socially inclusive Ireland remains a goal for our society as we continue to deal with the social implications of the economic recession. Bernardo's recently announced that Irish child poverty levels are such that we could fill Croke Park twice with the number of children living in poverty. In 2015, the Nevin Institute reported that one in seven of the Irish population lives on an income which is less than the official poverty line about 202 euros per adult per week. The Capuchin Centre in Dublin provide 2,700 food parcels a week. Five years ago, this number was 200. The Dublin Region Homeless Executive Report that in the third quarter of 2016, there were 4,006 adults accommodated in emergency accommodation. Of note, the number of adults with children had increased from 939 in December 2015 1,357 in September 2016. Ireland was one of the first countries in the EU to introduce a national anti-poverty strategy. All right, thank you. The government's updated plan for social inclusion 2015 to 17 acknowledges that since the introduction of the NAPS inclusion in 2007, the response to combating poverty has changed. And I quote, there is now a greater focus on modernising the social protection system, improving effectiveness and efficiency of social transfers, and strengthening active social inclusion policies. In achieving social inclusion, social protection plays a key role. Indeed, as the Minister said, social protection transfers are very effective tools for reducing poverty. Without these tools, in 2013, the at-risk of poverty rate in Ireland would have been 49.8% as opposed to the actual figure of 15.2%. However, social protection payments alone will not create social inclusion. As the, um, the inclusion document states, active inclusion is now defined as enabling every citizen, notably the most disadvantaged, to fully participate in society including having a job, and tackle the challenges such as poverty, social exclusion, in-work poverty, labour market segregation, long-term unemployment, and gender inequalities. Such active inclusion is a narrow view of social inclusion. A more expansive one views it as a multi-dimensional process aimed at creating conditions which enable full and active participation of every member of society in all aspects of life, including civic, social, economic, and political activities, as well as participation in the decision-making process. This necessitates a social protection system, which is not just about giving people a handout, but rather to give them a hand up as active agents in their own social inclusiveness, to become resilient, and to progress to full participation in all aspects of society. I would contend that in order to achieve this, the state needs to move away from a one-size-fits-all model of social protection, education, and training and support to those in our society who are socially excluded. As one participant in a recent study that I was involved in stated, you can't thrive if you're living at a level if you're working to subsist 
rather than to thrive and develop. And certainly your kids can't. I don't know how you would say that a one-size-fits-all approach would increase the well-being of everybody in a family. Lone parents and their children are the biggest group at risk of living of poverty and social exclusion in Ireland. And activation is regarded as the solution to this problem. In recent research that my colleague Rosemary Cross and I completed on lone parents and labour market activation, which was funded by the Irish Research Council and the Department of Social Protection, one of the key areas of concern is that Ireland's activation policy for lone parents with children aged over 14 is to categorise them as a job seeker. And there are no allowances made for the fact that they're parenting alone. Unlike other countries, there are no plans for a specific lone parent tailored approach to activation, which takes into account the unique challenges and the barriers to employment they experience. Given the fact that Irish lone parents tend to have lower levels of educational qualifications, those that are attached to the labour market tend to work in low-skilled areas with consequently low pay. Difficulties with cost and availability of childcare have been repeatedly acknowledged as an issue of concern for lone parents returning to paid employment. Indeed, precarious employment, which is the reality for many Irish people, necessitates a flexible income support system which can respond to ensuring that workers can fully participate in society. Participation in society for many involves caring for a family and critiques of lone parent activation policy focus on this issue. Much of it centres on the capacity of activation to deliver an adequate income to single parent families and that full-time employment is neither desirable nor practical in a home with one parent. Some question the extent to which the view from the bottom, that is the lived lives of lone parents, have informed the views of policymakers. Lone mothers place a high value on care and their comprehension of what good mothering is involves how they think about family life and employment. The capacity of a lone parent to work cannot be equated with that of a two-parent family. They only have half the time resources available to them that couple parents have. In addition, the role of parents in building and promoting strong parent-child relationships needs to be acknowledged as an important buffer against adversity. And so, what is the role of the academia in helping to bring about a more socially inclusive Ireland? As Cherney and his colleagues explain, the extent of direct influence academics have over policy or practice settings is limited. However, here at the Institute and in the Child and Family Research Centre, under the leadership of Professor Dolan and the director of Dr. John Canavan and other colleagues, our mission statement is to help create conditions for excellent policies, services and practices that improve the lives uh, across the lifespan through research, education and service development. In the centre, we aim to influence policy change that will improve the lives of people. Our role as academics is to inform policy and policy makers so that they can make fully informed decisions which lead to active social inclusion, which encompasses meaningful employment and gives all family types a hand up to act as active agents in their own social inclusiveness. Moreover, the pursuit of active social inclusion is an expensive endeavour involving significant investment education, training, income support and other social transfers. The role of research centres such as ours is to investigate and analyse the impact of these measures to assist policymakers in ensuring that limited resources are being spent efficiently, effectively and economically. Moreover, as social researchers, we play a key role in investigating the impact of policy on individuals and whether or not the policy is having its attendant effect on um, people with disabilities, older people, children, youth and families.
by ensuring that the lived lives of those at whom policy is aimed informs the views of policymakers. However, academics and policymakers won't always be in agreement. Academics do not face the many and varied political demands placed on policymakers who struggle to deal with competing demands for limited resources. So too, policymakers don't always understand the work of the social scientist, whose role is to ensure that the objective reality of what they're investigating is articulated and put forward, even if that view differs with the status quo. As academics, we hold a very privileged position in terms of our claims of knowledge and the trustworthiness of our research, which is not to say that social scientists are value-free entities. Rather, as Warren and Garthway caution, academics need to espouse the key values of free, free, academic freedom, which are the right to express views which differ and may conflict with funders without fear of reprisal from them or our institutions is essential if the integrity and credibility of academic research is to survive. However, what academics and policymakers have in common is a desire for a more socially inclusive society. As such, I propose that with this common goal in mind, Irish policymakers and academics need to deepen their engagement and consult more with one another, as there is a solidarity in the desire of both for a more socially inclusive Ireland, and it is incumbent on both groups to work together Thank you very much, uh, Michelle. Okay, so I'm going to hand it over to you now, and we're going to moderate some questions. Um, the rules are very simple. Uh, in life, we should be brief. In our questions, should, we should be even briefer, or more brief. So I'm not looking for autobiographical statements, just what you heard from Minister in terms of his vision around social inclusion, and indeed the response from Michelle, including a response uh, on behalf of uh, academic community to get out there and being realistic in terms of how it influences civic society. Um, I, I do note that the Minister did span all aspects across the life course, from breakfast clubs to pensions, so there was quite a good span. So if you could please identify yourself as a matter of courtesy, um, my good colleagues uh, Sinead and Luke have microphones, um, and we'll take three questions, uh, and don't disappoint me by not putting up your hand. Uh, so please, questions. The first question will be in the middle. <laughs> My name is Tommy Roddy. Uh, welcome to Galway, Minister, or should I say a future Taoiseach. Um, okay, just, just one point, uh, Minister, what you said there. You mentioned about uh, JobPat and Entrio. I'm just wondering what are your thoughts on that system. I actually went through that system myself and I found it good. It gave me a push to go out and get work and I'm following that career at the moment. But I have a friend who went through it, did all the, you know, what was necessary, and I'm not sure at the end of the year how um, it benefited him. And uh, the second question I have in relation to CTEC here in Galway, which administers it, um, do they actually get bonuses for finding work for people, or for the people that actually get work? Another question, please, hand up. It's very, very fortunate there's one just beside you in front, to the front here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Christy O'Carroll. I'm uh, involved with active retirement groups here in the Western region as development officer. And uh, thank the minister for his uh, talk uh, to us there now. And I'd just like to uh, ask, some years ago, a uh, lot of preparation went into producing a document called the National Positive Aging Strategy. It took six years to present, to, to build up, and then was presented in April of 2013. And I would like to know, has anything or happened with regard to that strategy? Or is there a plan for anything like that to happen? It should be certainly part of your remit, I think. 
Thank and you. One more, thank you. And one more question? Yep. So Sinead, maybe if you could. Interesting, all the questions are coming from the centre. Central questions. Uh, my name's Erin Breen, and I'm in the uh, Master's in Journalism program at NUI Galway. Welcome. Welcome to me, too. Hey, um, listen, I'm just wondering, as you are one of the front runners, as you had mentioned over here, as the Taoiseach, uh, should and when Andy Kenny um, steps down, what are your views on dealing with Donald Trump should you take over that situation? <laughs> And actually, I have a second question, but I don't know if I can get this in. I'll say it fast. As a medical doctor, what are your views on solving the medical crisis here? I, I understand you're no longer Minister for Health, but you must have some pretty uh, specific views on how, how to deal with the health crisis here. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Minister, in the order of which you prefer to answer those questions, <laughs> I'll give you a hint of which one I want you to answer. <laughs> I, I think I think I'll start in the order in which they, they were put. Um, uh, I, I, I suppose I don't get bogged down too much in the in, in the intricacies of, of of the way Department of Social Protection works, but um, um, but Intro obviously is our service, and it's um, the big Intro Centre, beautiful one here in Galway City, and it's our service where job seekers go and um, can get assistance, um, both with payments and to become uh, and and to, and, and to find employment. Uh, job path is a system by which uh, we outsourced to two companies, Taurus New and SeaTech, um, that role. Uh, and these are essentially people who are unemployed for more than a year. Uh, and um, the uh, staff from SeaTech and Taurus New work with them very intensively uh, and try to make them fit for employment and find them employment. Um, and uh, just as is the case with Intro, uh, people have mixed experiences. And uh, I come across people in my constituency office all the time who. Um, have a complaint about the social welfare office, and they may also have a complaint uh, about their experience with, with, with job path. Very often it's a personal thing or the way they're made feel by somebody. Um, but the best way to look at things overall is, is customer satisfaction surveys. Uh, and hasn't been published yet, but the customer satisfaction survey for job path uh, comes back with customer satisfaction in the region of 80%. So about 80% are happy with the service that they were given, about 5 or 6% are not. Uh, and that would be pretty normal, I think, by any service. I imagine if you surveyed people who came to my constituency office, you'd probably get uh, a similar result back from them. Uh, and that's just the nature of these things. There's never going to be any any service that people uh, are hundreds of satisfied with, and particularly when it comes to uh, job path. And I have this experience in my own constituency work. Um, there are people who find it really useful, um, helps them get employment. Uh, lots of people have got employment out of it. I'll be able to produce numbers uh, quite soon that indicates that people who um, went to a job path are more likely to get employment than, than, a, than a control group who don't. And I'll be able to produce those figures and stand over them uh, very soon. Um, but of course, there are people who don't like the attention. And I met a guy I met, met in the door in my own constituency uh, who was in his early 60s and had been um, called to CC Tech and really wasn't happy about it at all. And he kept telling me, you know, why you're trying to help me, don't help me, you know, help somebody in, the, in their 30s instead because he'd already given up on himself in that stage. He hit 60, he didn't think he'd ever get a job again, uh, and really wasn't liking uh, the, the kind of attention. But like I say, it is down to people's personal experience and the customer satisfaction uh, survey, which wasn't done by us, uh, was done by an independent company, um, uh, comes, comes back with a satisfaction around, uh, around 76 to 80%. Um, there, there's no bonus paid, no. Uh, the way it works is, is the company is paid by results. So the company only gets paid uh, if the person hold, if the person gets a job, and they only get paid if the person holds on to that job for more than 13 weeks. So from the point of view of the taxpayer, it's very valuable. It only costs the taxpayer any money at all if the person gets a job and holds on to it for 13 weeks. And then there's an additional payment if, if the person holds on to the job for longer. Uh, and that works very well in that it disincentivizes the companies from pushing people into employment that they're not going to hold out. Uh, because you have to hold that job for at least 13 weeks before the taxpayer has to pay anything at all. Uh, and what we're going to do uh, is report quarterly. 
uh, on the outcomes uh, from that program uh, starting in the next couple of weeks. Um, on national positive aging strategy, yeah, I'm, I'm very aware of it. I was aware of it as Minister for Health and aware of it as well um, now as Minister for Social Protection. Um, Mr. Helen McEntee has special responsibility for older people and it's her task to uh, push forward the implementation of that strategy. Um, it's a while since I've actually read it, to be brutally honest. It's probably, probably six months to a year. Um, but we do have a reporting mechanism um, across departments by which we look at the different recommendations and which ones are being implemented and which ones aren't. Um, I do get as frustrated as anyone else about strategies and all of our strategies because so many things are reported as being ongoing. And I don't know what ongoing means half the time. Uh, it definitely means not done. Um, but it probably means something else in between. Uh, and uh, something. sometimes I'm afraid we have too many strategies. But um, of course, we've now moved from strategies to action plans. That's, that's the, new, uh, the new strategy. But, um, but, um, um, but it is something that, 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 that we are implementing and needs to be updated as well. Uh, but um, you've prompted me now to uh, uh, pull it out and look at it over the weekend. And, uh, see what actions are ascribed to my department and how we're doing uh, in terms of implementing them. Um, Aaron Green, talk about the widest, the widest questions you could possibly ask. Um, I, I decline any question related to the Fine Gael leadership. I think that's, that would be premature. Um, but I will, um, will answer in relation, to, uh, in relation to Donald Trump. And um, um, you know, I'm not going to pretend that I'm happy he won the election. I'm really disappointed he did. Um, and uh, um, and I had hoped that uh, on being elected, that the fact he was elected might cause him to uh, moderate his tone uh, or change his behavior or, pay, or behave a little bit more gravitas. Um, and that hasn't happened. Um, and that has me very worried, quite frankly. Um, the Americans elected him as their president, albeit another candidate they got three million more votes, but that's the system they have. Uh, and we have to respect the fact that um, that's their system and he is their president and we have to try and uh, work with that administration because the bonds between Ireland and America are much greater and go on for much longer than any one president or any one administration uh, and they're economic and they're cultural and they're personal uh, so we have a duty to uh, work with the new administration. Um, we don't have to suck, off, suck up to them though uh, and uh, I think certainly uh, the um, uh, the congratulations statement from Angela Merkel uh, on his election probably summed it up for me uh, as to the, the right approach that we can take um, in the next, uh, the next four years, which are going to be, going to be very interesting, I think. Um, the biggest, biggest worry I'd have is he might be terribly successful <laughs> because, um, because um, politicians imitate other successful politicians because uh, ultimately our trade, uh, we can't do anything as politicians unless we get elected. And I would be worried in some ways that um, if he's successful, people will imitate uh, that kind of politics. But I will see how it pans out. Um, on health, I could give you a million answers to that, but probably the best thing uh, a former health minister can do is not to put into it. It's the toughest job in government, and um, I think Simon Harris deserves all the support and advice as he can possibly get. Uh, and I speak to him regularly uh, and give him a few tips and advice. But in terms of things worth reading, um, I, I don't know if you saw uh, the Sunday Business Post of the weekend, Stephen Kinsler, uh, who's an economist, did a very good piece, I, I thought, a two-page piece on health, and which tried to explain why we are where we are and where we might go, and I thought that was a very good piece, piece of work and a piece of our reading. Thank you very much, uh, Minister, I think for very frank and honest, which I enjoyed, uh, answers. Um, I'm going to let one last burning question if someone wants to ask it, and then I will close proceedings. So, anybody want to ask? Yeah, great, thank you. Again in the middle, but it's okay. Thanks, Sinead. Uh, I'm Stephen Gaffney. Uh, you, you mentioned about the minimum wage earlier, and I just thought I'd ask, what measures are the government taking other than that in order to make work more attractive, in particular in relation to precarious work, such as uh, zero-hour contracts or temporary contracts or involuntary part-time work? Um, um, yeah, on, on minimum wage, um, as, as you know, uh, was reduced by the government that preceded our government, um, or preceded my party coming to office in 20, 2011, uh, and was then restored and increased. So, so 
the minimum wage has actually gone up by 20% since 2011. Now, that doesn't take fully account of the reduction that happened prior to that. Uh, so we've had three increases in the minimum wage in the last uh, five and a half years now. Uh, and I'd anticipate the minimum wage will continue to rise uh, over the coming years. Um, and I also think wages are going to continue to rise over the coming years. We just need to make sure it happens in a way that's sustainable because uh, we don't want to go back into the cycle that we had before uh, of pay increases or welfare increases that weren't sustainable and then had to be taken away. And I'll go back to the kind of la lady on the door again. I feel like Enda Kenny now and the man the two pints. Um, but I remember during the teeth of the recession, knocking on doors and asking, uh, I ran into somebody in Hartstown in my constituency, and she couldn't understand what was, hap why was, that, what was happening and why were all these cutbacks happening. And she said, you kept giving me money when I didn't need it, and now I do need the money and you're taking it away. Uh, and um, that was, I don't think anyone could have put the um, case for counter-cyclical economic and, and social policy better than she did. And I think whatever we do needs to be sustainable. There's no point in giving people increases only to take them away uh, in a couple of years' time. Um, but I do anticipate that wages will rise and they should rise, uh, and the minimum wage will rise and should rise. Uh, and as I think I mentioned in the speech, what we need to do to make more work more attractive as well is to uh, reduce some of the costs uh, to go into work, and particularly around um, childcare and the childcare subsidy system coming in uh, in September, I think is very valuable. It's only a start. Uh, what's coming up a lot around unemployment is is for people in rural areas, the cost of transport, um, which I'm not sure how we're going to resolve, but clearly is, is a big, big, um, uh, big barrier to employment. And then also, I think, improving social insurance and improving social protections. Uh, you know, the fact that people have things like paternity benefit um, have things like illness benefits and so on um, is, 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 is extremely important and I would envisage um, expanding uh, social insurance and providing more protections and greater protections under social insurance uh, which is one of the ways um, that I think we can make work pay better. One of the ones coming back this year for example, and it's a small thing but it's possibly just an example of what I'm talking about uh, is, um, is people having refunds for their dental treatment and their eyeglasses and things like that and I know people in the past really appreciated the fact that in return for their PRSI that they would be able to see their dentists have certain treatments done, get their eyeglasses back, things like that. And I'd like to see much more uh, benefits deriving from social insurance uh, than currently do. Um, a little bit much more like France and some other countries that I think uh, do these things um, do these things very well. Um, on the zero hours contracts, I'm reluctant to answer that because it doesn't fall directly under my brief. I know it's under under Minister Breen and Minister Richard O'Connor. The last I heard about it, there had been a study done uh, in UL um, which indicated that there weren't really zero hour contracts. There were certainly if and when contracts, uh, but that zero hour, zero hour contracts were, were un unusual um, in, in Ireland. Um, we haven't come up with a solution to, to that yet. I know some people propose a banding system, for example, our minimum number of hours, um, but um, a lot of people don't agree with that. There are obviously people for whom it suits, for whom it suits to have um, on-call arrangements or working certain hours, so I'm just not up to date on where we are in that yet, but that was the latest um, the latest um, uh, update that I had on it. But I suppose to cut a long story short, um, making work pay is often used, it's, it's generally a centre-right term, uh, and it's often used to threaten people with welfare cuts uh, if they don't take up employment. Um, and for me, that's not what it's about. Um, I do believe in conditionality, by the way. I do think we should reduce benefits for people who don't, who don't work with us. Um, but making work pay should be about um, improving the quality of employment. Uh, and more and more, now that we're reaching, becoming again a high employment, low, low unemployment economy, what's going to be an important part of our industrial policy in the future is to make sure that we've more better paid jobs uh, with better security. And that just makes sense for so many reasons. I'd love if my department's family income supplement budget was a lot lower uh, because people were getting better paid. And one of the things I'm very conscious of in trying to design uh, the working family payment is I don't want to subsidize employers to underpay people on the basis that the Department of Social Protection will come along and top it up. Uh, so making work pay is about wages and it's also about the benefits connected to employment and it's also about reducing the barriers to employment. So, um, thank you very much, uh, Minister. Of course, when you say it's the last question, lots of people put up their hands, but uh, we are unfortunately against the clock. Um, before I close, I just want to say, well, first of all, to um, I want to thank these events don't happen by themselves. Uh, I particularly want to thank my colleague, Dr. Kieran Walsh, here in the Institute, and colleagues, the stalwart Gillian Brown and uh, Sandra Hallinan, who has always helped uh, to organise these events here. And a particular word of thanks to Liz McConnell from the President's Office for her continued work. 
Um, thanks to President Jim Brown, as always, um, but a particular thanks to Michelle Miller and to uh, Minister Bradker for coming and sharing and uh, discussing what is key to the Institute here. The, the final comment I made is that the, the Minister has invited the Institute here and the community here to engage, particularly because of the broad sweep of what we do here, and we will take that up on that invitation. And the one thing I'll promise is I won't do what uh, many years ago, minister, when she was Minister for Children, Mary Hannafin told me not to do, and that she told me is to be a two-handed researcher. And I had to ask her, of course, Minister, what does that mean? She said when anybody researchers come into the department, they always say, on one hand you have this, and on the other hand you have that. So we'll try and be forthright in what we deliver. Um, please join us outside to mix and mingle uh, where we have some receptions, and thank you very much.